Hello and welcome to this 14th lecture of our course blockchain and its applications. Also, it is the second lecture on the subtopic of elements of blockchain that we started with our last lecture. In the last lecture, we talked about what a blockchain is, how this blockchain is constructed out of a collection of blocks connected in the form of a chain. Today, we are going to cover the topics, the basic concepts that we will discuss today are uh, what is the generation cost for blockchains. We have said that there are these blocks which are to be constructed by solving a cryptographic puzzle. So, we will see that how much uh, typically it costs uh, in terms of resources to generate the blocks. We will also see beyond the block headers that we discussed in our last lecture, we will today discuss about how the transactions are actually included in a block and how they are organized in a block. And then we will see that when these transactions are actually carried out like say one party tries to say transfer some bitcoins to another party say Alice transfers 5 bitcoins to Bob kind of examples we discussed in our previous lecture. So, we will see that how that actually takes place and there are indeed these notions of what are called bitcoin scripts which are used for carrying out these transactions. The keywords for today's lecture, now these are hash generation rate, we will see what it means. We will also talk about what are the inputs and outputs of transactions. So, uh, as we include several transactions in a block in Bitcoin, we also needs to we need to understand that what would serve as the input for those transactions and what would be the outputs. And of course, we will talk about the Bitcoin scripts. So, first let us take a look at block generation cost. So, with a quick recap of what we discussed in our last lecture and in the previous lectures on the basic cryptographic primitives, we said that the heart of this security in creating blockchains like Bitcoin is the notion of that puzzle solving that we have seen. And what was that puzzle solving? For generating a block, we have to combine a number of transactions in the form of a Merkle tree. The root hash of the Merkle tree along with other components which we discussed in our last lecture. Those are to be combined and there is this piece of puzzle which was that nonce. So, that the total hash of all these components including the nonce would satisfy certain requirements. We have discussed that in detail in our previous lectures. Hence, this puzzle solving that is determining a nonce with the required number of leading zeros is the computationally expensive step which is to be done by certain special nodes. I mean that special means anyone can possibly do it, but as we will quickly see that it is not so easy to do it computationally. But anyone can possibly do it to generate the blocks and that nonce that would satisfy the requirements of the number of leading zeros that is also included in the block header in every block of the Bitcoin network. So, it means that someone will have to spend some computational effort and resources and also of course, cost in order to be able to generate that nonce and in effect we say that be able to solve the puzzle which also means that anyone would be able to now generate a block. Okay. So, if you remember that the example we took where in the in the website that is associated with the book that we are often referring to. So, in that website we had given this option that say this is the input message and this is the number of zeros and then we have to figure out what would be the value of the nonce. And if you remember that for even uh, asking for say 5 or 6 leading zeros it was uh, searching for a very large number of uh, such uh, possible integer values and then it could actually get a proper output that is the hash value that satisfies those, satisfies those 
requirements. So, in our very last lecture, we also discussed that number of leading zeros is not 4 or 5. So, there could be some 16, 17 such leading zeros and determining nonce that when combined with the other components of the block header would result in a hash with that many number of leading zeros that is expensive and it this expensive is 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 very high and if you see now in this particular slide what we are saying is that typically the energy efficiency meaning that the cost of generating these hashes it is about 100 joule per tera hash and it is not that you can do it on your laptop and, and just try out your luck and get uh, the nonce that would satisfy those requirements. So, actually some special purpose hardware, so these are like that what are called application specific hardware uh, for Bitcoin uh, mining. So, this step of generation of blocks is called mining. So, that can perform about 750 terahash per second. So, if you look at this particular example what we mean by ASIC hardware, so there indeed would be Mm, lot of different sites where you will get more details. So, this is one typical site which talks about the ASIC hardware and then there are special purpose uh, these servers with uh, different names and they are not uh, uh, very cheap. So, they are pretty expensive and it is not really very easy to individuals to afford to get this, but um, these are the types of hardware which are indeed used for generation of blocks. I wanted to give you some idea. And then if you see that when this block generation is happening in that case, in many cases multiple such different users are trying to generate the blocks by trying to solve the puzzle. And many of them actually would go waste because as we will see later only the first node which could solve the puzzle which is called the minor node will get what is called a block reward which we will discuss later. And then lot of people are trying in this Bitcoin network to generate these, uh, these solutions for the different blocks and the total Bitcoin actually if you see that it has a very high hash rate. So, this particular, uh, this particular uh, figure gives you some idea about uh, what uh, it looks like. Okay. So, if you look at it that over a period of time the, the total hash rate of the Bitcoin network that has been, uh, it has been increasing and if, if you see today if you look at the values here. So, it is about uh, 150 million tera hash per second. So, that is a huge amount of computation that is going on in order to ensure that the blocks can get generated in the Bitcoin network. And uh, many of it actually goes waste because only one of them will succeed or uh, the first one to succeed will get the reward, rest of them will not get any reward at all. So, this network overall this Bitcoin network consumes uh, a huge amount of electricity annually and there are some figures and these figures vary a lot because nobody really knows the exact amount of energy that is being spent because people are trying and that might not generally get um, accumulated and added up in the in the statistics that we see, but some typical values are that the average household uh, Germany in Germany of 4 people consumes something like this 4000 kilowatt hours of electricity this energy per year. And so, you see that this amount of energy that is being spent in this network that can uh, power up to somewhere around 20,000 households. So, this is a huge amount of energy that is being spent. And then as I said that because it requires these types of uh, uh, specific hardware. So, you and I we individuals will not be able to compete with uh, people who have that kind of hardware and indeed it is not just individuals, but actually uh, these are different such companies which uh, come up with this uh, concept of what we call pooling. So, if you look at this one again I am referring to uh, the real um, btc.com website where you are getting these uh, different blocks that are getting added to Bitcoin and uh, in, in real time. So, we can see one which was added say today we are talking about uh, say a few minutes back maybe 20 minutes back one got added and if you see that it was uh, generated by 
these what are called pools. We see one called F2 F2 pool and then Ant pool and Mara pool and all sorts of these different Binance pool. So these are all uh, some consortium of these uh, uh, nodes who pull in their resources and that's why they are called pools. And they are the ones who can finally end up actually being able to generate the the blocks. So that means that overall it indeed needs a huge amount of resource. Uh, and computation power which uh, uh, is spent for generating the blocks in a bitcoin and uh, so this actually of course also ensures the tamper proof operation and in terms of honest nodes so that means that if there are most of the nodes which have the computation power they are honest then the bitcoin network will actually be working uh, as expected so that means that it is more about that the majority of the computation power should be available in the hands of the honest node. So, that is uh, the principle on which this bitcoin network works and for that matter many of the other blockchain networks. And then uh, what happens in each of the nodes in blockchain uh, in block coin what we have is that these are uh, the so called peer nodes and each of them in the blockchain network including bitcoin maintains a local copy of the blockchain. So, you and I can also join this network and then you will get the entire say bitcoin uh, network all the all the blocks since the very first block the 0th block and then the size is not very high it is about uh, of the order of some 350 GB and in, in our own machines we can actually have the entire network available. So, as a new user joins the network she can also get the whole copy as I said you and I can also get the whole copy and it would be similar to what we are seeing in the btc.com site. So, you will get all the different uh, blocks as they are getting generated uh, all updated real time in your own node. So, all the replicas uh, need to be updated with the last mine block. So, as and when these blocks are getting generated you can see that simply it is that new blocks are getting generated and if we uh, look at these blocks we see that um, uh, the very recent block that got generated is available in front of us and if you uh, see this lecture later again you will see that more got added and if you have your own machine acting as a node in the bitcoin network you will also be able to see these ones in your local machine. And then they are updated and they are to be cons consistent means all of them should have the latest copy of the bitcoin network. So, so, the blockchain at different peers need to be exactly similar every every peer node would be having the same look and same information about the blockchain network. So, that is the whole idea. Now, we come to the transactions in a block. So, if you remember we said that a block has got the block header part and it has got a collection of transactions. Okay. So, the transactions are organized as a Merkle tree remember what a Merkle tree is. So, this is um, the same figure we had used before. So, these transactions now that we are talking about these transactions are actually these ones. Okay. These are the transactions and if you remember we said that this will be organized in a Merkle tree. So, we are doing a quick recap of that and for each of these transactions we first generate the hashes. So, I have H00, H01, H10 and H11 this H00 and H01 and combined into H0, H10 and H11 are combined into H1 and now H0 and H1 are combined into the root hash. And if you remember the way we did the verification of a block hash there we had to enter out of those 6 different components which were used to compute the block hash one of that was this Merkle root. So, that indeed is this root hash that we are talking about. So, that is what we need to understand in order to be able to appreciate what we are having here. Now, I am going back to the previous slide. So, these transactions are organized as a Merkle tree the Merkle root is used to construct the block hash as I mentioned. So, if you change a transaction you need to change all the subsequent block hashes. So, and that makes it really difficult and as we have said that it takes a lot of computation power. So, the difficulty of the mining algorithm would determine the toughness of tampering with a block in a blockchain. Now, if we see the transaction in a block how they are organized once again uh, if you uh, are not able to exactly 
uh, follow what is written here because maybe the font size is not very large and I tried to take one sample example from the real uh, Bitcoin network. So, what I will do is that I will simply go to the Bitcoin network here and say I click on the latest block that I see here. And if we see that the latest block is block number 7040048 and when you, you are going to access the btc.com site and go for this Bitcoin network, you might see the more recent one would be something which is having a number later than this. But say I click on any one of those blocks and I will be able to see how these transactions are organized. So, I clicked on say first block. So, let me go back again. What I did was that I clicked on this block number 704048 and then again if you remember in the top we see the block header information including at the very beginning we have the block hash which has got the required number of zeros. It has got other metadata in the block header and then if we see the transactions. Now, you see the transactions listed out here. So, this part up to this is the blockchain uh, this particular block header and then we have this collection of transactions and there are 2309 transactions in this. And each of these transactions is, uh, is organized one after the other here and for each of the transactions we also have its particular if you see the, uh, the hash of it. Okay. So, each of these represents the hash. So, this is the hash of the first transaction, this is the hash of the second transaction and so on and so forth. So, you get so many such transactions. And if you remember that the total size of the transaction should add up to the maximum size of the block. And now, what we will do is that we will take a look at more details about these transactions. But first thing to note is that each transaction has the hash like is shown here. Okay. So, now we go back to this slides and let us see that how these transactions are represented in terms of inputs and outputs of the transaction. So, if you see the first transaction here, we have say 100 Bitcoin as the input and this 100 Bitcoin is now spent whoever is the owner of this, uh, these 100 Bitcoins. So, spends 40 Bitcoin to one other users and 60 to another user and then the user who got 40 uh, then spends 30 Bitcoin to another user who again can spend 10 and 10 and likewise the one who got 60 can spend 50 and then it goes to the next one and next one. So, we have this transaction 0, 1, 2, you know, 3 and 4. So, what happens is that if say any user say here this particular user who got the 40 bitcoins and spends the 30 bitcoins the remaining 10 bitcoins remain with that particular user and likewise that this user who got the 30 bitcoins and spends 10 and 10 uh, then uh, total spent is 20 and uh, this user returns the remaining 10 bitcoins. So, that is how these transactions are actually done. Now, let us next see that like this previous example. So, this was Alice and this Alice had 100 bitcoins and Alice spent 40 bitcoins on Bob. So, Alice basically transferred 40 bitcoins to Bob. It means that Alice carried out a transaction for which the input was 100 bitcoins and output was those 40 bitcoins and these 40 bitcoins are to be paid to Bob. And that is what we are showing here that here on the left we have Alice and on the right we have Bob. So, what is important is that Alice will send these 40 bitcoins like was shown here say assume that this is indeed Alice and so this is Alice and this is Bob. So, Alice is spending these 40 bitcoins to Bob that means Alice is carrying out a transactions which should show that first of all Alice indeed has sufficient number of bitcoins. So, she is having 100 bitcoins. So, let us assume that this 60 bitcoins has not yet been included in any transaction. So, first transaction that Alice is making after she got these 100 trans uh, bitcoins as input, the first transaction is that Alice is now paying these uh, 40 bitcoins to Bob. So, that is the first transaction. So, for that first transaction the input would be those 100 bitcoins and the output would be those 40 bitcoins. So, let us see how this can be actually done. So, what we will do is that we will look at this particular uh, example where we 
see Alice on the left and uh, Alice is spending these um, uh, 40 bitcoins and sending them to Bob. So, Alice is uh, say this transaction is about from Alice to Bob. So, which we represent as A to B. So, transaction is going from Alice to Bob, but then how will Bob verify that transaction is actually originated by Alice? And as you now well understand based on our discussions on basic cryptographic primitives is that the notion of digital signature would be used. Okay. So, what Alice would do is that Alice would send the public key along with the signature. So, of course, it will be this transaction that which is this A to B this transaction and then this if you see that it is signed S A is signed with the private key of Alice and then the public key of Alice would also be sent to Bob. And if that is done, then what can Bob do? Bob can now see that get this part and can verify because if Bob now decrypts that signature with the public key of Alice that has been sent, then Bob will get back the correct transaction. So, then Bob would be convinced that indeed it was sent by Alice. Okay. But then what are these transactions? So, these transactions are not just like these signatures as we are talking about that was more for our initial understanding that we have to make use of digital signature in some form, but indeed what we do is that in Bitcoin that we transfer what are called scripts. So, these scripts as we will see in detail are the ones which could convince Bob that indeed Alice was sending those 40 Bitcoins to him and later on when Bob tries to spend those 40 bitcoins on somebody else like the example if we consider that if this was Bob in the middle as we can see here that that Bob is the uh, this this one in the middle as we talked about the, uh, the second uh, from the left on the top and then when Bob is trying to spend this 30 bitcoins out of his 40 bitcoins. Bob also will have to convince that indeed he owns those 40 bitcoins and it should not be a case that Alice had sent it to say Carol and Bob somehow got hold of it and now trying to spend 30 bitcoins out of it. So, Bob will also have to convince to the next party that indeed he was the person to whom these 40 bitcoins were sent by Alice. Likewise, for the first case when Alice was spending these 40 bitcoins to Bob, Alice also had to prove that those 100 bitcoins were indeed owned by her. So, all these are to be proved from one party to another as these bitcoins are moving from say Alice to Bob and to Carol and uh, uh, somebody else. So, as we said that this will be done uh, this through the use of what are called scripts and these scripts as we will see these are called uh, script pub key and script sig. So, when Alice is sending these bitcoins to Bob, Alice will be using this script pub key to ensure that it can only be decrypted using the public key of Bob and public key of Bob, I am sorry, you can be decrypted with the private key of Bob and the private key of Bob would only be known to him and that is what forms this what is called script sig. So, script pub key is used for transferring the bitcoin from the from say Alice to Bob and when Bob is making use of it, Bob will be use, using this notion of what are called script sig. And uh, as I said that Bob will be able to spend the bitcoins okay, only if the two scripts together return true after execution. So, these are scripts which can be executed. So, we will see what it means by executing the scripts in detail and the scripts they are simple compact stack based and processed left to right. So, these are some very simple type of language. So, these are scripts means that these are to be actually used in the context of a machine being able to execute those. It is not that the script will be actually looked into by any human being and seen whether it is correct or not. Instead, whatever will be done as we said here that Alice will be using the script pub key to generate the transaction to be sent to Bob and then Bob when is using say 30 bitcoins out of those 40 bitcoins, Bob will be using the script 6. So, these uh, 
two pieces of script will be working together and this working will be done not manually of course, but they will be done through a particular process that we will discuss in detail in our next lecture. But in this lecture we would like to introduce the notion of these scripts. So, these are some simple stack based uh, languages and it is very similar to the fourth language and this uh, particular language that we talk about this is not Turing complete. So, it does not have loops the uh, it does there is no halting problem the whole purpose is that because this is going to be run not in any centralized server or in not in anybody uh, uh, any particular users personal machine where they can look into the problems and it is not like your say a C language where you can have loops and which may not terminate and those things. So, you would like to avoid those types of issues and that is why it is a very simple language it does not support loop and it is meant in such a way that usually will not end up in such types of situations where the script execution does not complete and if it does not complete then those bitcoins which have been transferred from say Alice to Bob will be hanging in there somewhere not, not that Bob can make use of it or Alice might not be able to take it back and those problems will occur. So, these scripts are uh, uh, written in very simple languages and which can be very easily um, executed and then the results uh, would always be going to be um, uh, something that is easy to understand and there will not be any such difficulties like the script execution is not terminating. So, with every transaction Bob must provide a public key that when hashed is the address of Bob embedded in the script. So, what happens is that when say Alice is transferring we took the example of 40 bitcoins to Bob, but why would Alice transfer 40 bitcoins to Bob because maybe Bob provided him her some service or Bob sold something to Alice and so on. So, now when Bob is claiming those 40 bitcoins from Alice Bob will send his public key, but actually the public key in its original form is not sent instead a hash of the public key is sent to Alice and Alice pays to the public key hash. Okay. So, it is like pay to public key hash. So, that is the mode of operation typically there are other modes of operation. So, pay to public key hash means that Alice will be paying to the hash of the public key of Bob. So, when Bob will be claiming it, so that is what it says that Bob will again hash his public key and this hash that Bob is now getting should match with the one to whom Alice had made the payment. So, that is how these two matching would be done and a signature to provide ownership of the private key corresponding to the public key of Bob. So, Alice would be encrypting all these using the public key of Bob. So, Bob will have to ensure that he knows the private key. So, that whatever has been encrypted by Alice that can be decrypted by Bob and that is the proof that indeed Alice had meant to send it to Bob and nobody else. So, that is the purpose of this uh, script 6. So, we will look at this in more detail in our next lecture. So, we conclude our today's lecture with a summary that we discussed first of all the cost of block generation and we have seen that it is really huge a lot of computational power is required and a major fraction of that computational power is actually possibly getting wasted. So, there is a lot of wasted energy and it is one of the concerns also and we will see that there are other types of proofs and this proof what is called proof of work that people have actually spent computational power called the proof of work and uh, that is the, the basic foundational principle of the Bitcoin blockchain. And we have also seen how transactions are included in blocks and then finally, we have seen how scripts are used for making and claiming payments. So, that brings us to the end of today's lecture. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and also the same set of references that we have used. So, you can refer to those and of course, there are many such uh, other books. Thank you very much.